Welcome to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. I am Dr. John, the guide for your heroic journey towards greater health, success, and most importantly, happiness. And now, on with the show. Hey everybody, this is Dr. John back with the latest episode of The Evolved Caveman and you are going to want to buckle in as Dan says for this one because this show I've got Dan Sykes and I am very psyched about this interview because Dan is an entrepreneur, filmmaker, body worker and founder of the Somatic Training Network, a company dedicated to learning and sharing somatic arts and practices from around the world. He has studied somatics with master instructors in the USA, Canada, Russia, Latvia, Netherlands, Portugal, and more, and earned the titles of Sistema Bodywork Instructor and Martial Arts Instructor under Grandmaster, and I might screw this up, Mikhail Ryabko? Ryabko, mm mm-hmm. Mikhail Ryabko, yes. And Master Instructor Vladimir Vasiliev respectively. He has also produced and directed two seasons of Emergency Fish Party, which is on YouTube, and his current show, Somatic Fanatic, along with his new book of the same name. And Somatic Fanatic is also available on YouTube as well as other platforms. Dan, welcome. How are you? Thanks, Dr. John. Really appreciate your invitation to come and uh, spend a little time with you and your listeners. Excited to be here. Well, I'm I'm thrilled that you came along. I, you know, I did a, a retreat with Dan Millman back in Costa Rica a couple of years ago, I guess pre-COVID. And Dan's had, he's been heavy into some of this training as well, which is big in the martial arts side. And he brought a guy along from Russia that he did this physical demonstration that I've never forgotten. And it was basically through channeling his chi or energy that he rooted himself in the ground, apparently, is kind of how he explained it, and pulled the biggest guy in the room who pushed against him with all his might. And this guy's standing on one leg and could not be moved. So I don't know. My guess is this is kind of along the same thing, but let's back up a little bit and tell us why you're so invested in somatics. Why does it matter? For me, uh, what the book is about is that I was a, a very non physical person for my whole life, for the first 45 years of my life. I really spent most of my energy in my head. My uh, my passions were music, learning to play instruments, singing, writing, eventually filmmaking, and um, all my activity was in my head. I hated exercise of any kind. As a kid, I felt it was being forced on me against my will. And by probably no coincidence, I was also um, very overweight. Probably 10 years ago, I was probably 50 pounds heavier than I am now um, and perceived myself as um, non-athletic and very weak, overweight and and such. I still led a very uh, exotic and uh, engaging and and a life that um, probably no one would believe my actual autobiography if they were to know it. So very exciting and involved. But at 45 years old, I, uh, my ex-wife and I sold our company for quite a bit of money. And I was in this position of being able to do anything that I wanted. I had left filmmaking to help her with this company 12 years before. And so I went back to filmmaking and I wrote, produced, directed, and starred in a, a film that we shot entirely in Russia, a feature film. And I worked on this for four years. I wrote the music for it and all kinds of things. And um, four years later, um, probably by no coincidence, I, I, I came to realize that this movie was not going to get picked up by a distributor and that I really couldn't do this many more times without jeopardizing the money I have. And I, I realized, wow, I'm either going to blow all the money I've got making movies that mean something to me or I'm going to wind up being somebody's employee. And I haven't been somebody's employee in 20 years. It's too late for that. Simultaneously with my ex-wife and I realizing that we had come through such a 20 year run, but now we were heading in completely different directions and our post selling our company uh, life. And uh, it just wasn't going to work. So I found myself with my whole life feeling like it it was falling out from under my feet. And while Mm -hmm. I was financially comfortable, I felt um, empty. I felt hopeless. Like anyone who's gone through the midlife crisis, that the, the, the party is no longer inviting me along. The best is (laughs) done. 
And um, I, now I'm just going to wait around for 30 or 40 years to die, this kind of poisonous mentality. And um, it really, I had met these Russian special forces guys that you met one of at, at your event while we were in Russia. I saw the training they were doing. It, it seemed overwhelming to me and um, that there was no way I could really participate in this as a non-athlete. So, but I knew something had to give. So I got more and more fascinated with the possibility of training with these guys. So I started taking yoga um, to get myself ready to, to, to deal mm -hmm. with these, the, with these guys. First step. And I really had to put from, from my point of view, I had to play like tricks of language with myself. Cause even when I was breaking a sweat doing yoga, I remembered all these feelings from childhood and I, I couldn't stand the word exercise. And I remember that first year of doing yoga saying to myself over and over again, you're just moving, Dan, you're just moving. You're not exercising. You're just moving and you're sweating, but who cares? I had to yeah. really, I had had some kind of ingrained thing against exercise. Um, and then I eventually started training with the Russians and um, it was the most intense thing and, and remained, you, you know, those guys can go as intense as you can possibly imagine any at yeah. the drop of a hat anytime, but it fundamentally changed my life and, and began me down this journey that's uh, talked about in the book of having certain epiphanies with certain master instructors like Colonel Ryabko which those epiphanies gave me other questions that led me to not feel like this particular discipline could really answer that question. And then mm. I would seek out uh, another discipline to get a different flavor of training the nervous system. And we live in this amazing moment of uh, human endeavor where anything that you're interested in, we now live in a moment that if you can, if you can afford it, you can jump on a plane and train with the very best people in the world within a couple months of getting that interest. And that's what I did. And the, the way the book is laid out is every chapter is about a master instructor in a certain discipline that I went to sort of in the order I went and the epiphanies I had with them and the new questions that were brought to my mind from those epiphanies and then a search for an answer and then finding another discipline and another and another. And three of them really became permanent parts of my life, which would be yoga, the Russian martial arts sistema, and the um, therapeutic is not technically the right word, but um, this discipline called the Feldenkrais method, which is mm -hmm. normally used for people with quite serious problems, neurological problems mm -hmm. and recovery from accidents and things like that. And it's the most gentle, so, I would say, of any of the arts. So that's what drew so my back attention. up. Thank you. Back up a little bit and Tell the listeners what you mean by nervous system training, because you, you refer to that phrase, and I yeah. don't think most people know what you mean by that. Well, they don't, uh, including the people who do ner nervous system training. Most of them don't know this phrase either, because this phrase has never been spoken until about two and a half years ago. I studied wow. with um, yoga people. What, what I discovered, I kept feeling no matter what discipline I went to, that there was something that was drawing me to certain disciplines and not to others. Um, and everyone I met had this sense that yoga and Qigong and Tai Chi and Feldenkrais method and Sistema, all these modern and ancient disciplines had something in, in common. There was some relationship. Mm -hmm. But every time I would ask uh, one of these grand masters, what is it we're doing here? What's a one sentence version of what is yoga doing? What are we like in one sentence? And the yoga people would explain to me, there is no way to say it in one sentence, Stan. The thing and the moon and the, 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 the uh, vastness of the practice and the benefits are what people would immediately go into and it would become very kind of poetic. And this was very mm -hmm. frustrating to me. Then I met the Russians and I was like, okay, these guys are soldiers. They're going to tell me, what are we doing here? And they had the same problem. They could not boil it down to a sentence. Then I went to the Feldenkrais people. They're all scientists and they couldn't boil it down to a sentence either. And this frustrated me. 
and made me realize this is part of probably a big part of the reason why Feldenkrais and Sistema and basically every discipline other than yoga are still relatively little known in the West. Um, most people on the street are not going to know about these disciplines that changed my life so much. And this frustration of everyone telling me there is no way to define it as a writer, this kind of really irked me until about two and a half years ago, I was doing my morning walk. And this phrase nervous system training came to my head and it stopped me short. And I did one of these like Terminator, like analysis quick in my head. And I suddenly realized, wow, this is what every one of these disciplines is doing. The, the, the ancient ones don't call it that because the nervous system was not known in, in its current form. We now know it in. So they use other words to express what we now know is the nervous system. But these uh, phrases like chi and chakras and all this, stuff, th th these are expressions of what our nervous system is doing from the understanding from three, four, five thousand years ago. Um, but can I in interrupt fact, you there and just ask, yeah. so would you also throw like Wim Hof's deep breathing methods or breathing methods in there to sustain your, the body in co yeah, very absolutely. cold climates or water? Would you also uh, throw in, uh, what was the other one I was thinking? Of? Oh, so underwater knife fighting was a training course that I looked at where you're training to not panic underwater when someone's coming at you with a knife. Anything that's going to increase your ability to physically feel as opposed to execute habits of movement. I would consider a somatic art, an art that is mm -hmm. focused on training the nervous system. Any uh, In the martial arts, we have uh, what are called hard forms and soft forms. And some forms that, that borrow training uh, and techniques from both of those worlds. The hard forms... Um, where you are learning like boxing and other forms where you're learning to execute a series of moves in quick succession and learn this muscle memory. This is not nervous system training. Nervous system training is learning to overcome panic using techniques of breathing and attention and moving your attention around and trying to release um, tension that's, that's building in your soft tissues as um, the oxygen levels in your blood go down, the CO2 levels rise, or you're laying on the ground and 10 big guys are laying on top of you and, and you feel claustrophobic, whatever it is, mm -hmm. any, any system that has you get into these uncomfortable states, cold water, whatever it is, for the purpose of calming down and physically feeling the reality of what you're dealing with instead of psychologically trying to run away from that discomfort. I don't know if you're familiar with the guy, um, Tom Myers, who does anatomy trains. Have you ever heard of Tom mm -hmm. Myers? No. Got an amazing no, no, no. system called anatomy trains. I highly recommend it for anybody interested in health and wellness. Um, and he has a, a great definition of fear being, uh, I'm sorry, pain. is a great def definition of pain, which is, uh, uncomfortable sensation with the psychological predisposition to run away from that sensation, to, to, to try to not feel it and look it in the eye. Well, it's interesting. I mean, cause this is what I do with clients a lot of times, like with uncomfortable emotions, right? Is okay. You've got these physiological symptoms in your body and then how do you label them and how do you sit with them and how do you relax into them? You know, if we don't label them like, Holy shit, I'm having a panic attack. But rather, you know, my heart rate just went up. My throat feels constricted. I've got some muscle tension going on. Can I just sit with that and breathe into it? And, and so it's interesting, kind of these overlaps. I think all that, that what I discovered is that there are very many disciplines that are, in fact, like Baskin Robbins. There are 31 flavors of the same ice cream. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's the same thing. They're training the nervous system from a different cultural viewpoint. Um, and from a different uh, vision of outcome. Um, some, some disciplines are training you to dance. Some disciplines are training you to recover from accident and surgery. Some disciplines are training you how to fight. Some are training you to be at one in a meditative state, um, like all the ones where you're on a, on a single mat and you're just by yourself. Um, 
So when you say there's a lot of overlap, I think there's actually a tremendous amount of overlap. But sometimes the costumery of the cultures of origin make them seem very different. Um, the Indians, they look very Indian and the Russians look very Russian and the Americans look very American. But actually, they are really um, training ourselves based on the only thing you can do to improve the function of your nervous system is to learn to develop the capacity to physically feel more. That is what we're actually doing. Mm. We, we cannot learn to move better. There's so many hundreds of thousands of commands being done. Say more about we feeling more. I hope to do would. that. So we have to learn to feel more. What's, tell me more about that. So I, I think because I talk a lot to men, right? And I think men are really resistant to feeling more anything, whether it's emotion or physicality. I mean, they're like, screw that. Like, I'm just going to suppress it and run away from it. And then I'm good. Well, this to me is an understandable, um, mistaken idea. Many mm -hmm. people who are in pain, uh, and certainly men love to do things on a regular basis that cause themselves pain. pain yeah. <laughs> they love to play football. They love to fight. Yeah. They, they, you know, Rugby. Nobody wants to feel pain, but men are constantly yeah. doing stuff that, that <laughs> causes pain. Uh, feeling the burn, feeling the strike, feeling everything. So... It's very uh, understandable that people would react to pain by doing one of two things, either trying to numb themselves or distract themselves. And this is really uh, the heart of what most uh, addictions are about, mm -hmm. is that you're in physical or emotional long-term pain, and you're trying to either numb yourself or distract yourself from that pain through activities or substances or, or whatever the case might be. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you. What we wind up learning over a long period of time is that most people, by the time they hit 30, physically feel, in my estimation, about 10% as much as the normal human capacity to physically feel. I don't know if you know, but 50% of human beings cannot directly, neurologically, directly experience pleasure with their hands. 50% of people cannot wow. feel pleasure. Um, and it's possible to, to rewire your nervous system to feel direct pleasure with your hands again. But uh, men are very resistant to feeling. What we find, what we find is when you, um, when you geometrically increase your capacity to physically feel inside yourself, not just on the skin, but feel inside your bones, feel all this tissue, feel all the interaction all around the body. As I raise my hand, there's so much. Well, sensation and can I, being can I jump in there, Dan? Everywhere. Because go ahead. That's, that's, that's a sense called interoception that, you know, the awareness of like your gastrointestinal system, like how full are you or what's your heart doing or how, in, how inflated are your lungs or what are your muscles doing? And it's funny because when we're growing up, we're taught there's five senses and, and they, they missed a bunch of senses in that class that I was in, interoception being one of them. So I'm, I'm again, I'm totally with you. It, it, it's so the conclusion I came to was that if you um, train to feel more and more and more, all kinds of benefits happen. Uh, tension goes down in your body. Your movements are much more efficient. Your blood pressure goes down. Your mood moves. All kinds of things happen. And, and this is pretty well known within all these disciplines that it's a kind of one-stop mm -hmm. shop for wellness. But for pain, and for men especially, when we're bound up, it cuts off our ability to physically feel. When we have lots of what I call chronic tension, um, in the scientific world of uh, Feldenkrais, they would call it excess tonus of your muscles. But everyday language, you have muscles contracted for no apparent reason. Uh, the guy, the muscle, uh, the bodybuilders that can't straighten their arm out. We've all we've all seen this. The stiffness mm -hmm. of old people. This is because lots and lots of muscle cells in the body are permanently engaged for lots of reasons. We won't go into it. But when you start systematically and over time deciding, I'm going to learn to feel more over time, just like martial arts, not in the next three days, I'm going to go white belt, yellow belt, brown belt. I'm going to make this a permanent 
curious endeavor of mine to learn to physically feel more and more. As that feeling blossoms out, what happens is you don't just feel your pain more. You feel lots of stuff more. And your pain becomes less a percentage of your total experience. You say, yeah, my Mm -hmm. elbow hurts just like it did last week. But the air blowing in between my toes feels great. And, And how soft my neck feels feels great also. And, 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 and as that happens, um, the pain becomes less of your experience and your tonus relaxes because when you're in pain, um, part of the reason this tension happens is because when you're injured psychologically or physically, th- this is almost like nature's way of giving us a little cast to, to, to yeah, stop yeah, self-protection. The But then that gets habituated. There's a great uh, experiment by Dr. Hannah that I recommend people try just to to see how true this is, that you can habituate tension. If you squeeze your fist as hard as you can for three minutes and keep reminding yourself and every 10 seconds, redo the squeeze and redo the squeeze and redo the squeeze for three minutes straight, and then try to just pop your fingers open. There's no way you can. Your fingers mm-hmm. barely open. And if you do it for 10 minutes, you're going you're gonna to have to like physically move your fingers out. Tension habituates. And when you're tense from a reaction to something for too long, not all of those muscle cells will let go. And they are involuntarily constricted permanently. And most, most middle-aged people are walking around with a, a, an amazingly high percentage of their muscle cells permanently engaged. This creates yeah, I mean, high blood pressure. It creates um, it, it, it. It increases inflammation in the joints. It ju- it just does so much wear and tear. It gives you supplements in your spine. Ask your chiropractor mm-hmm. why do I have the supplement? Only about half of chiropractors will tell you why. If you haven't been in a car accident, it's because you have muscles on the back of your spine and in front of your spine, both permanently engaged and putting uh, pressure on your spine. In the first place, if you don't do something to let go of that tension of those muscles, they can they can adjust you and you'll feel great for an hour. But that pressure is still there. And that's why you're going back the next week and the next week and the next week until you coach your nervous system to let go. You're in the same boat. Pardon me for interrupting. It it strikes me that a lot of this begins with self-awareness. This has been a kick of mine the past few weeks just because I've come across new research that shows that. 95% of us report being highly self-aware, whether it's internal self-awareness or external awareness, how how do other people perceive me? Um, And in fact, it seems to be about 10 to 15% of us that are actually self-aware. And it strikes me that some of this process, maybe a lot of it, is creating greater self-awareness, often through, it sounds like, physical movement. It's, you know, I, in my company, I feel that my job is to be an ambassador of nervous system training of all kinds. And I have found that the word awareness can sometimes be a turnoff to people. Anyone who's sort of like a non-yoga lover, and that includes a lot of it's men. It's quite vague in, in esoteric, States, yeah. Uh, th- that that word can have them stop listening. And if well, you I think are it's scary very, to a lot of people. Yeah. So I try to be careful with language. So I stick to this Mm -hmm. issue of trying to learn to feel more and more. Because if you feel profoundly more, what it means is that you are in the moment, you're present. All these words that we use in in the gentle arts that men shy away from being present and being aware. A lot of people think we're about to, you know, douse patchouli oil on ourselves and, you know, (laughs) namaste ourselves for the rest of the day. And men are just like, get me out of here. Um, But really what, what both of those two terms mean to me in a practical sense is that you are able to generate a lot of your attention toward the way you physically feel right now in more and more detail. We generate for beginners, we generally start trying to make them raise my arm I'm going to try to feel this shoulder more and more like a microscope where I have this internal sensation, the external sensation. I'm figuring out what it feels like. So you you learn to feel in more detail 
And then you learn to feel the connectivity. You learn to feel what's happening in other parts of the body that aren't so much directly doing the work, but are being pulled where, where the flesh is pulling them along. And, and you come to realize over time that your entire body's moving. If I move my arm, my weight's shifting on my pelvis. The leg muscles are, are doing, the stomach muscles are involved. The neck muscles are involved. There's so many hundreds of thousands of commands. When you come right down to clench this one uh, muscle cell versus release the other muscle cell on the opposite side of the limb to allow that movement to occur, our conscious mind can monitor, I think it's about 2% at, mm -hmm. at most of all the things that are actually happening. So I, I tell people um, what's counterintuitive about um, training the nervous system is, uh, what's a good example? Let's, let's take stretching, because a lot of guys are into stretching from the sports world. So I'm gonna explain that versus how training your nervous system would be an approach to stretching. When you're stretching, okay. there's two different things happening. One is, um, if anyone's uh, um, familiar with the word fascia, it's a kind of new mm -hmm. thing, even in science. So I'll just say, the, the let's say your muscles are uh, tight, so which means they're short, because muscles pull their power toward becoming short. Every individual muscle cell, it's like a spring in a sense that when there's no electricity going to it, it's long. And when the, when the nervous system commands it to um, contract, it goes into a shortened state, and it's using up energy to do that. But unlike a spring, individual muscle cells only have two positions. They cannot partially contract. They can only fully contract or let go. So the difference between raising a little thing like, like this thing, I'm holding uh, maybe weighs as much as a couple pieces of paper, or picking up a 40-pound weight is not how much I'm contracting all my muscle cells. It's how many muscle cells is my nervous system hmm. commanding to fully contract. And what happens is when we have, uh, so if we're gonna stretch something that's tight, you've got a lot of muscle cells that are contracted. That's why it's tight. And, and there's this uh, 120 times a second, 121 to 126 times a second, there's an active command to each one of those muscle cells to fire, 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 fire. And it's stuck in the on position. So we can stretch the fascia, the, which is extracellular material. But the other issue going on in stretching is that you've got all these commands of muscle cells firing, and they'll give up. You, you can force a stretch, and, and, and they'll finally yield, even though that, that signal is going. But then the next morning, you're doing the same stretch again, because all mm -hmm. those muscle cells go back into that contracted position. Now, what yoga would do, what Feldenkrais method would do, what Sistema would do, is in the midst of moving, you're going to try to coax those muscles to stop firing. And that's a very different thing. And that's why over years, uh, a sportsman who's stretching very often is doing the same stretch on the same muscles for years at a time. But a yoga practitioner is loose as a goose and, and is, is progressing in this, um, in this uh, release of this tension in the muscles. So That's how would they go they about, so how would they go about sending the signal to let those muscle cells release? Is that just, is that conscious? The, the, yeah, this is, the, it's, it's, uh, it's a conscious decision to train in this way. But what I discovered is that all of these um, disciplines, what links them is not just the fact that they're training the nervous system, but in the fact that they are all slow motion disciplines. We are all enabled with a natural capacity. Our nervous systems create habit, habit of movement, habit of thought, habit of all stuff for efficiency so we can survive. But we also have this absolutely natural capacity to overwrite these habits by combining two things simultaneously. Very slow motion movement and putting your attention toward physically feeling it. We are moving to feel more. The goal is to feel. The mm. only goal is to feel. So if we do a little experiment, I'll, I'll show you right now, and then I'll explain why it works. If you want to feel your arm, if everybody just lets their arms hang, 
And we try to just feel the detail of the arm. Just feel, can I feel, what can I feel inside? What can I feel with the skin? What can I feel on my arm? And now keep your attention on feeling your arm and start to slowly raise your arm. And maybe twist your arm, rotate your arm and feel how much more you can feel. Moving gets all this stuff mashing up against each other, stretching, working, releasing. It causes so much more sensation that moving allows you to feel more Mm -hmm. than you can when you're still. And the nervous system learns by comparing what is more difficult with what is more easy. This is the way an infant learns. We have two ways of learning. We can learn by logic, which we do more and more and more as we grow up. And we can learn just by feeling as infants do. They can't learn by logic yet. So everything they're learning is by comparative sensation. Uh, I try to turn over. It's hard. I put my head down a little and try to turn over. It's easier. Wow, I'm going to try that again. This is the way an infant learns. And all of these disciplines are, what would you say, reacquainting us with this other way of learning, which is comparing sensation. So when you're moving in slow motion, and I'll I'll stop, there's two things happening. If I raise my hand quickly, I'm triggering a habit. I might have learned how to raise my hand like that 20 years ago, and I might be overusing my shoulder in an inefficient manner, but that's, that's what I'm used to doing. If I go very slowly at 25% that speed or less, very slowly, I cannot use habit. It's way too slow. Mm -hmm. I cannot trigger habit. And if I'm feeling it, I'm elongating time. So there's so much more sensation for my nervous system to analyze because now I'm raising my hand over 20 or 30 seconds. So that combination of not being able to trigger a habitual movement a, a, a pattern of contraction and release that of hundreds of thousands of, of muscle cells and being able to analyze it over time is what allows the, the nervous system to kind of refocus on that and draw its own conclusions of, oh, wow, I don't actually need that shoulder clenching so much. I, I could shift my hips over and wow, it's so much easier to do that. So doing very slow motion work doesn't feel manly to the Western man. And I'm not saying it should replace strength training, but my feeling is that really a true model for health is nutrition, strength training, and then training your nervous system on purpose as a separate, completely separate ordeal that should also be done on a regular basis, just like strength training. Yeah, I love what you're saying, because one of the things that strikes me is I absolutely believe that we humans are creatures of habit. And we go through the day mindlessly. We go through the day as automatons with very little conscious thought about what we're doing or about how to move our body. And it strikes me that what you're doing in some of these methods is moving what is habitually unconscious and making it not habit and conscious, making it mindful and like yeah, it, it just seems more, like you're more, making more of a more conscious of your movement, movement so you can pick and choose. On, yeah, it, it, you, you, over time, you get more of your movement based on analyzing and, and deciding and less of it in triggering habit. The other thing it's doing, though, is it's overwriting outdated habits and creating mm-hmm. better habits that are more efficient because we cannot operate just by, we cannot survive without habits. There's so many things happening right. in us that we habit is not the enemy, but just like no. in the, um, the world of uh, hypnosis, they say they have things called limiting beliefs, which I believe are a habit of logic. And mm-hmm. hypnosis causes the, the nervous system to re-examine those limiting beliefs, update them, and come up with a, a, a better belief to settle on that's more realistic for where you are now as opposed to where you were 20 years ago when that limiting belief took hold in you exactly the same thing can happen with movement as well yeah it makes me think of my daughter back when she was i don't know a year year and a half and i I watched her she had learned to walk and then one day she looks at the stairs and she goes over to the stairs and slowly backs up to the stairs and crouches down halfway, kind of looks behind her, sees the stairs still there, 
and then crouches all the way into a seated position on the bottom step. And I thought to myself, holy shit, like we have to learn to sit down. And, and then, you know, you take it from that place and, you know, 20 years later, actually much less than that, you sit down automatically without thinking about it. So that becomes habitual. And it's just, yeah, this is a fascinating um, approach to kind of undoing some of those habits and giving you some choice back. What, what a lot of sportsmen don't realize in their uh, efforts to get healthy and um, for people who are, who are looking to look ripped all the time, if you look ripped, if you're walking around with a fully engaged six pack all the time, it means you have muscles that are not letting go. And what I learned yeah. was that it robs you of strength and speed because you're fighting soft tissue that's not soft. And yeah. uh, because of this thing that muscle cells on an individual level can't be partially contracted, any muscle cell that is contracted is not available to work. Uh, I, I started my very first Sistema class. As I said, I was way overweight my whole life. And when I took my first Sistema class, I said to the teacher, we're really going to have to work on strengthening my core because I cannot even do a single sit-up. Never have been able to. And he looked at me and said, that's not possible. A sit-up really doesn't require very much strength. There's no way you, you can't do one. Mm -hmm. And I showed him and I was grunting and groaning and I couldn't get up. And he asked me to stand up and he felt my stomach. And he said, can we do a little experiment? He said, I have, I have a, a type of punch that's called a therapeutic strike. It, it, it's, it's gentle but heavy. And, and what it does is it coaxes the muscles to release hmm. from this impact. Can I give you one of these? Uh, and it won't be too hard. And I said, okay. And um, he sort of scared me a few times. And then when he saw I was in between um, reactions, he nailed me and, and felt like my whole stomach dumped out. And he said, quick do a sit up now. And I whipped out 15 sit ups with no effort. And this wow, and so it's completely the, blew my mind. This is 45 years after never being able to do a sit up. And, and he and said so to me, you know, that as a segue ahead. into this punching, beating and whipping yourself into, or others into profound re relaxation. Cause that's pretty wild. This is it. This is it. What he pointed out to me was that most people who are overweight spend their entire lives sucking their gut in. And all of your Stomach muscles are fully engaged. He said, you can't see it, but you have a rocking six pack in there. But there's, yeah. no, there's no muscle cells left to do a sit up. <laughs> and when I felt you, it was like a piece of wood in your, uh, you know, in your stomach under the layer of fat. It was like literally like a board. That's why I struck you. And now he said, what you're going to find out in training and releasing this permanent tension is your magnitude stronger than you think you are right now with no additional strength training. What we mm. need to do is get this tension out of your muscles, and then you can use them. And this was the beginning of my journey through the looking glass into counterintuitive truths of our nervous system. Yeah. And, and so, cause I, I looked at the, um, the trailer for emergency fish party and, and it seemed like that's a lot of what this was, was getting punched or, uh, you were using some wooden sticks at some point. And I, you know, it's, so it seems to me like it's getting those muscles to release. And that's a big part of what you're doing on that show that you uh, had done for two seasons. Yeah, absolutely. And um, there's a lot of trauma release that happens because we can have permanently constricted muscles in ourselves due to inefficient movement. Um, inefficient, like I had this bizarre idea in my head my whole life that uh, standing up from a squatting position was not primarily from the butt, uh, like I would think with the chest, with pushing myself up in a push up. But I had this weird idea that standing up was expanding my legs from the knee, almost like a scissor lift. Mm -hmm. And as you, you as a doctor would not be surprised, I had lifelong knee pain because I had this strange idea in my head and I was organizing myself in this fundamentally incorrect way. So you can have tension in your body from this kind of inefficient attitude, or uh, I was in a cast for six weeks and walked funny. And then when it came off, I, I still walk a little funny because I've habituated this. The other thing, which is a little more difficult to release the tissue is reaction to trauma and trauma release. Yeah, and, and speak a little bit about things. trauma and physically healing from trauma. 
trauma, uh, you know, you can excise trauma through um, psychotherapy. It takes a long time, but but um, what Dr. Peter Levine, who's uh, author of a, an amazing mm -hmm. book called Waking the Tiger, anyone who mm -hmm. feels they have PTSD and, and reactions to things that happened a long time ago that are getting in the way of them, living a, a resilient and easeful life, I highly recommend this book, Waking the Tiger by Dr. Peter Levine. He invented a system called somatic experiencing, which is sort of like uh, where psychotherapy and the somatic arts meet. What Dr. Levine does is he has people recall events or triggers, if they can't remember the events, that were traumatic. Uh, I got in a car accident. It was traumatic. If I'm so young, I can't even remember that car accident. But every time I hear a car go by, I know I'm panicking. So whatever's going to trigger this PTSD feeling. And then when people are triggered, he points their attention to feeling the physical reality of what's going on in their body and staying in that emotional state while trying to coax whatever muscles will allow themselves to be released consciously to release them. When you feel that same emotion, this is why we call emotions feelings, because every emotional state has a pattern of muscular contraction that happens in the body that we come to feel that's jealousy. I feel this is frustration. I feel mm -hmm. this is love. It's these different patterns of muscles contracting. And, and the nervous system starts to rewrite all this information when you feel that emotion and you coax the body to change that pattern of contraction. And suddenly it doesn't add up to the way it has been feeling. Lots of amazing changes come and people have cathartic moments. We do it through, uh, as the, the Russians say, they, they're back flushing those emotions by physically engaging those tense muscles with tools, with sticks, with, with strikes, certain types of strikes that are mm -hmm. forcing these muscles to release. Uh, um, uh, rolfing, people might mm -hmm. uh, have heard of rolfing. This is another, yeah. you do it with deep hands, tissue. not tools, but you do deep tissue and you just leave it there. You press on deep tissue, you find a little lump, you press on it and you just stay there. And what you're doing is you're well, putting the nervous system, go ahead. I remember, so I, back in my early 20s, I was in a six-car pileup, car accident, had wow. soft tissue damage. And I remember going to an acupressurist, a uh, big guy, Toby, trained in Sweden. And he would just, he would get biofeedback, which always fascinated me. Like he would have me put my arm up and he would put slight pressure against it. And then he would rather run his other hand along the, quote, meridians in my body. And at certain points, my arm would give out. And that's where he would stop. And then he would just put some pressure on that point along the meridian. And it hurt like hell. And yeah. I kept saying, dude, like you're killing me here. And he would show me how hard he was pushing somewhere else in my body. I'm like, no, like no. you're not telling me the truth. And, but that's what he was doing. And I was like, this is like, it was almost hard for me to believe. And yet it was highly effective. Absolutely. You know, the, there is a tremendous amount of pain or, say, discomfort generated by applying pressure to tense muscles. It has it, it, mm -hmm. Everyone's clear on this. Uh, this is why getting punched hurts so much is part of it is the contact of bone on bone. But a lot of it is that you have this shock going into tense muscles. That's why the Russian special forces take these extreme measures to soften they're special forces guys. I call them the Raggedy Andy dolls of death because they- you So can they relax into the blows? They're so relaxed that one, they, they can move with the blows, but two, even what hits, it's hitting relaxed muscles. So the, huh. the amount of pain being generated is 5% of what it would be if they were walking around with tense muscles, which can come from fear. If you see somebody swinging a bat at you and you haven't done training, that fear is going to make you tense up and it's going to hit yeah. uh, hard muscles and it's going to hurt. Um, but the, the tense muscles, if you, what we say, therapeutically just apply pressure and do this kind of pain you're talking about and leave it there, what it's doing is it puts the nervous system, eventually the nervous system realizes, wow, I have two choices, suffer or relax. 
And as soon as it relaxes, that pain goes down. And that is the basis hmm. of a lot of the Russian stick work as well, as you just giving the nervous system a simple choice, suffer or relax. I'm just going to wait here, my friend. I'm going to relax. I'm not going to add tension by pushing. I'm going to leave it disengaged. And so I'm going to. That's what that's coach called. That's, it, that's relax. stick work. Where you've got, yeah, that's they're, a Russian they're stick body work. Yeah, in Russia, ends, they call it stick massage, but in America, you know, you can't use the word massage unless you're, so yeah. I call it Russian stick Russian. body work because I'm in the United okay. States. Um, but that is, is the theory is that they dig into all those tight muscles. And what they do is remind you about these meridians, just like he told you, if I stick sharp sticks into the back of your neck and it hurts, you can tell yourself all day long relax my neck muscles because it hurts and they won't relax because your nervous system doesn't know what to make of it. It's too intense. Yeah. It won't let go. But if I'm putting the sticks into you, I can feel that point that you were just talking about. I can feel where you're bound up down the meridian. And the meridian is just muscles that are used to all working together to perform certain types of movement. They're in a habit of working mm -hmm. together. So if the pain is in your neck, and I feel that at your sacrum or say your knee, uh, I can feel if like the back of your knee is tense because I can't feel below it. I can't sense it through the sticks. So I'll coax you to let go of your, your knee. And that your nervous system will allow you to do because your knee is not under duress. There's no sense of danger there. And yeah, you can consciously tell your knee to let go. And what happens is when your knee lets go, the flesh under that stick in your neck also lets go a little bit oh. because the entire meridian lets go. And so we, through this work, similar to what you experienced, we're trying to re, um, uh, reteach the nervous system that we are moving in these lines up and down our body, that we function and we feel in these myofascial meridians, which are just muscle groups that work in tandem with each other. And because they do, they're used to all clenching and all releasing at the same time, up and down the body in lines. That is the way we move. But the nervous system can, can sort of forget about that. And part of what yeah. this training is to remind everybody and, and their nervous systems that we are really, uh, there are 12 meridians up and down the body that are used to working together. And if one part of a meridian tenses up, the whole meridian to one degree or another tenses up, maybe not as much. But it does. And when one part of the meridian releases, every part of the meridian releases. Fascinating. Yeah. I, I mean, I had spinal stenosis a couple of years ago where the Ooh. bones of my vertebrae continued to grow and impinged on the nerves. And it, and I've always had kind of nerve pain that I've dealt with. So, you know, you talk about pain, that's like an 11 on a 10 point scale. And this got yeah. so bad. Like I would just walk downstairs and I would get a jolt of electricity throughout my body that caused me to just hit the floor. And then all of a sudden I'm just looking for the nearest place to lay down, which was off in the floor. And I got surgery for that. And it kind of went in and roto rooted out those vertebrae, but then I had to go look at, okay, so how do I get my body to go back to relaxing into being really, because it affected almost everything. So let me ask you this. We only have a few minutes left. Mm -hmm. Where would you suggest people go to begin a journey into this nervous system training? Where do you start? My feeling is you start by, um, you're welcome to come and, uh, of course, watch the video, um, podcast on YouTube, somatic fanatic. Uh, every episode of Somatic Fanatic has an instructor that is interviewed as part of the, the show. We do 60-minute to 90-minute episodes, and every instructor that appears on our show is required to record a free full-length class that is available for people who watch that episode. So I would say um, every one of our episodes, we do them in sets of three, and we aim at a specific type of person, a specific type of ailment. This week, we're working on one about neck pain, for instance. Um, so I show some somatic fundamentals about the neck. And there's an instructor on episode, we do th packs of three, three episodes about oh, neck okay. pain. We just did three episodes about back pain. So we do them in three packs. And um, we offer free training. And I, I think really the key is see if you get any benefit out of slow motion movement and paying attention to what's feeling. And, and if that does seem to make sense for you, then the next thing is to find a discipline that makes sense for you. 
Are you, do you want to work up a sweat? Do you want to not work up a sweat? Are you in the middle of healing from a, a traffic accident and you need something ultra gentle? There are lots of disciplines that are really aimed at different kinds of people in different stages of their life and with different challenges. And um, at Somatic Fanatic, we talk about them all. We are trying to create a community where all disciplines are welcome and considered equal, equally respectable neighbors. Um, and I try to um, help people in the comments. Uh, I try to make suggestions of the kinds of disciplines they might want to try for their lifestyle that makes sense for them. The key is you got to find a discipline you want to do. So you mm -hmm. cut out your three times a week to do it because just like anything else, just like playing a violin or learning how to box or anything, if you're not doing it at least three times a week, you might as well really not even bother doing it because that is what makes the change over time is the repetition a practice. Yeah, yeah. Making a practice and developing over yeah. time and building on, on what so, you're learning each time. Dan, I, I love what you're saying. I love what you're doing. Thank you for doing it. And tell people just in closing the name of the book again, the name of the podcast, where they can find you and anything else that we might have missed. Somatic Fanatic is it. Again, I am not a somatic master. I know a lot of somatic masters. I'm a somatic fanatic. I'm an enthusiast. <laughs> I, I, I preach for people to lead with curiosity. Uh, so Somatic Fanatic on Amazon for the book, Somatic Fanatic on Audible in about 10 days from uh, when we're shooting this uh, for the audiobook. I'm reading the audiobook. And of course, Somatic Fanatic on YouTube. We're just getting rolling, but we're going to do, I think it's uh, 99 episodes a year of 60 to 90 minutes. And uh, each one will focus uh, on different aspects of this vast world of training your nervous system for everything from being a better boxer to being a better grandparent, to being a better lover. Everything can be improved. Your nervous system is your operating system, everybody. All sensory information is coming in and all commands for movement are coming out. So by increasing the function of your system, you increase the function of your entire life. So please get a little bit curious and see if there's something that makes sense for you in this vast world of nervous system training. And if you're like me and so many people I've met along the way, it will fundamentally transform your life in a better direction. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for sharing, Dan. I really appreciate it. And that is it for this episode of The Evolved Caveman. If you like this episode, please remember to share, rate, review, tell all your friends. If you didn't like it, you don't have to do a damn thing. Thanks so much. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 